So with that, Myron, the floor is yours. We're just totally delighted to have you here to give the keynote speech. And Myron's gonna talk about the Black Scholes Morton option pricing technology and even what is more to come. And I'm excited about that that part. So all yours, Myron. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. Basically, I uh, I don't know where people keep getting that uh, resume description of my past because a lot of those things become obsolete <laughs> over time. But uh, I appreciate uh, the rendition. Uh, as you get older, obviously, then the uh, list gets longer and it uh, takes longer and longer. Theoretically, I guess we should stop talking when the introduction takes longer than the actual speech itself. So. Um, yeah, I'm going to share my thank you very much, and I'm sorry I didn't get here earlier um, in the in the conference, but it looks like a very great conference. And actually, I'm happy that it's getting to the end of the year, simply because uh, that'll be the end of the 50th year, and then maybe we can get on, and then we can wait and celebrate the 75th year and uh, of the uh, uh, Black Scholes uh, Merton technology. So that would be great. So I'm going to share my screen here if I can figure out how to do this. Um, let me see if I can do this here. Um, uh, let's see my PowerPoint. Let's see, how do I get down what I had before? I lost it here. Share. I'm just going to share. Okay. Let me see. Oh, here you go. Okay. I'm getting closer to this. Not so much an expert in all of this. Okay. The, um, yeah, what I'd like to do here is really talk about option technology and its applications or things that to come and some research that I've been doing over the last number of years and thinking about all this and, and the technology and what it's going to do going forward. And, um, and uh, so I'd like to just go back a step and think about, uh, as Sanjay said, what we have thought about in finance over the years, and it's really uh, finance theory has had a profound effect, basically, on um, on applications, and that's very important. So most of what we've done in our finance and think about financial economics is really based on a micro-positive view uh, in terms of taking an economic approach. So what we've done is talked about a theory first, and our theories, which are great and uh, lead as a framework to what we tend to do and, and how we tend to instruct and inform our applications. But really what we're trying to do is think about how to help firms and investors make better decisions and to a uh, great effect, okay? Which in my view differs from the micro positive approach that macro positive approach of most economics departments in the sense that, uh, you know, relating to the famous uh, difference which Marshall said that economists don't tell a beer maker how to make better beer, uh, but we in economics and finance and the business school approach tend to think of how to help uh, the beer maker make better beer by thinking about whether marketing decisions or investment decisions uh, or uh, and the like. So, so that really differs. And a lot of what we think about in the history of what has been done in our area is that we've had the Markowitz uh, portfolio theory approach, which really talked about the idea of uh, diversification and the fact that what uh, is important to diversification, what risks are retained and what risks are not retained in diversification, which was uh, Markowitz's contribution. Now, Freeman, at the time Markowitz proposed his thesis in that and uh, was defending his thesis, said that Markowitz's uh, portfolio theory work was not economics. It was just statistics. It was not economics at all. And, he, and Markowitz had a lot of trouble uh, uh, getting through his dissertation process, which turned out uh, to be completely wrong because it's had such a profound effect on practice and the evolution that we've seen over time. Uh, Sharp's work, which um, 
talked about uh, the capital asset pricing model, not only talked about the idea of thinking about how to think about diversification, but how to even to measure risk or to reduce the dimensionality of risk from being just the portfolio to individual securities uh, was a great contribution and became the framework for so much of applied work that's done right now in terms of work that's done in the uh, financial uh, sectors where we think about sharp ratios or information ratios or benchmarks and trying to think about factor risks and uh, whether there's excess returns or alpha. So he's defined a whole dimension. Markowitz and Sharp defines a whole dimension of, of how we tend to move forward in finance and its applications. And Fama and Samuelson and the fish and market and market prices being revealing that really an interesting question is in markets, how the prices inform and prices are so important to everything and are markets sufficient itself that the information is sufficient in prices and what does prices give us in terms of information contact has had a profound effect and the like. And then uh, basically the Medigliani Miller models and uh, where corporate finance has had its evolution or its roots, the idea that what counts is asset risks and not necessarily how you finance it. And uh, Merton obviously had worried a long time about the possibilities that the corporate finance models were, didn't take off as much as the Markowitz, Sharp, and Fama model. And a lot of it was based basically on the idea of data, having data available, which allows us to do testing and see whether the models that we're proposing to use were efficient and added value for making decisions over. And that has been uh, something that we have had a great growth in our area. We had sort of the first blockchains that were used because we decided to capture data and to be able to use that in our decision-making. And then also as, as uh, Thank you for this conference and others that we've had this year, but the uh, you know, Black Shoals Merton option pricing technology and the idea that insurance and risk transfer. And here you get a, an idea of how our uh, micro positive approach and uh, the macro positive approach intersect because basically we had the Aero de Bru state pricing models and, um, you know, and basically that you had many states over time and many time periods, but it's very hard to operationalize that, to think about having state prices and being able to use them as state and time discount rates. And then from that, we had figured out that basically you can subsume a lot of this if you assume uh, theoretically that there's just one state variable and that's the market. And there's a market evolution from that as others in our area have shown uh, that you can decompose and use the one state variable to figure out the, op, the state prices uh, over time and cross-sectionally. So it's a very, and it op, makes it operational and usable for capital budgeting and other decisions. And then the, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about today is the idea that uh, Merton and Samuelson and Merton in particular, who's going to be talking at uh, conference, uh, sub, uh, sub conference, I guess, in a, in a couple of weeks, really uh, set the idea of thinking about time and the dimensions of time and investments and the idea of using time as an important component. And my thinking is that time is something we have to bring in more and more into our research. These uh, models that we've been using uh, to think we have to think about the dimensions and how time is changing uh, and how time changes things. And I'll talk about that in more in a moment. But one thing um, uh, uh, whimsically or the idea, hmm, I get my screen advanced here. No, there we go. Um, is that what I thought about is what would happen if we think about what option models tell us about various things and uh, how we can use information uh, and what would have happened if we had a huge database and options were developed before portfolio theory and before um, the various evolutions that we had seen and uh, what do we have we learned and what can we learn in using options. And one thing we've talked about is diversification 
And Malkiel has always said that um, a diversified portfolio is that we have, uh, that everyone should diversify. And that is a free lunch in the sense that diversification is very important. That's true. And uh, as Daryl pointed out just a moment ago, when you have shocks that occur, basically the, uh, the diversification tends to be lost or you have a lot of high correlation events, which cause a lot of problems for the economy to continue to function as it's done in the past. So we have, uh, one of the interesting things is we have an option in our portfolio is really less valuable than the sum of the options in the portfolio and less shocks produce high correlations. And that we can test. It's interesting. We have data that are available every day on Bloomberg that tells us exactly this. What about the S&P 500 and looking at the uh, value of the implied at the money option, um, the uh, three month option, for example, on the S&P 500, and then looking at the sum of the option prices of the individual components of the S&P 500. And that tells you exactly what the degree of correlation is among the assets in our economy. So at times of shock, the uh, value of the, uh, the uh, option on the portfolio will be actually about 97% of the value of the individual, some of the individual stocks within the index. And it could be as low as 0.1, which means that beta has more, no effect. So we have a, a market of, of uh, securities versus a securities market. And basically it's currently in the low 20s right now. So and on average, it tends to be about 40 or 50. So that basically you always have believed that the uh, a portfolio of options is more valuable, obviously, than a portfolio options on the portfolio, but it fluctuates quite dramatically, indicating that at times of crisis in, in, in uh, 2012 and in, in 2010, when you had uh, European crisis in, in 12, and then you had the uh, crisis in 07, 08, it can jump as high as in the high 90s. And also in March of 2020, it was in uh, very high. So correlations are changing dramatically when you have the underlying stock index. And so diversification is great at times as it is currently, but at other times it's quite low. And the interesting thing is that what it, what does this uh, tend to imply from the idea of what crisis does and how we can handle crisis going forward. And um, that's one important point that we have to think about in terms of the future and evolution of uh, our theory and how we think about uh, shocks and how they impact our uh, decision uh, making and in investments and intermediation. So, and the correlation, one of the things we have that I find is that we always have said that stocks are negatively correlated with bonds. Uh, and, and this has been the tenor of the idea of the 60-40 portfolio, but this is not necessarily true all the time. Sometimes we get the commercial bank policies uh, uh, create uh, a lot of uh, positive correlation and sometimes a lot of uh, negative correlation associates when we have liquidity shocks where people move from actual risky assets to uh, safer assets and trying to uh, reduce risks. And correlations are really hard to estimate using historical data, and they're not constant between stocks and bonds. It couldn't be the case that stocks were always negatively correlated with bonds if that that were true, you'd have an arbitrage in the sense of buying bonds and buying stocks and right proportions would could produce a positive rate of return over the risk-free rate without actually incurring uh, risk. So basically, um, it has to be the case that sometimes stocks are negatively and sometimes stocks are positively correlated with bonds. There are no option data currently on whether stocks, because uh, we don't have a portfolio of uh, options on a portfolio of uh, a, a, a value, uh, uh, a portfolio of stocks and bonds, 
but we have um, actually information in the option markets which tells us the direction because if we have options on bonds and the options on bonds have a very high um, uh, positive uh, skewness implied in them in the sense that the upside to downside is uh, very high and conversely equities have a very uh, negative skewness in the sense that downside is higher than upside as can be deduced from the option markets, then that would indicate to us basically there could be a, a negative correlation. And conversely, if the skewness of bonds is uh, positive or, or negative and the skewness on equities is negative, you know, that tends to look as though there could be a positive correlation. It's not signed. You don't have a sign or the magnitude, but you have a direction. And this changes all the time because one of the brilliance of options, when I started in options with Fisher and then Bob, uh, was that basically there was no public options that were traded, but basically there uh, was only over-the-counter options on a few various instruments. And then when the option market started in 73, there was 16 options traded on uh, uh, only call options. And now we have over 4,000 options that are traded each day and have multiple stri strikes that are very liquid. And they give us tremendous information about the risks uh, that we see going forward in the market. Tremendous information about how risks are changing in the market. You have options on commodities. We have options, obviously, on myriad equities and international equities. We have in, uh, options on bonds, our domestic bonds, treasuries and corporates and international bonds, and, and obviously options on currencies that are not as readily available at pricing as options on equities and, and commodities and bonds. And some markets are more liquid than others, but basically uh, the market is very deep and thick and has a lot of cross-sectional information that can be used to deduce things such as the diversification. Uh, this the diversification I talked about here in A was only the, the correlation among stocks in the s and P500 or among equities and how that correlation changes. And here you can also use the option markets to give indications of the direction of correlation between stocks and bonds, which are very important in terms of thinking about whether static portfolios or the risk of portfolios, such as the 60-40 portfolio or other portfolios that are traded or are marketed in the investment area. And also you get um, you, uh, the idea between uh, the third uh, area, I don't know why I got too many Bs here, but it should be C, required rates of return on assets. But we have here, uh, we've learned a lot about the DCF model as being a static uh, fixed model without uncertainty. And basically the option to invest or state prices with asymmetric information. Uh, but basically, um, uh, how do we think about the real options? And if we're thinking about changing value of options, one of the interesting things about work we have to do is we can talk about real options or real investment opportunities, but it's the idea when you have options that are fixed or the idea we have a fixed uh, option which has uncertainty to it, how do we reduce the uncertainty? How do we make it easier for making real investment? So once you have a, a constraint, which is there's an option price, then can we change the terms of the option, either the volatility or the duration or how to think about dynamics in investment? So the static to the dynamic investment, yes, but also how do we change the idea of the volatility? What information do we do? How, what is finance telling us about what corporations are gonna do if you have investments that are made that are fixed? How do you make them more liquid? How do you make them more flexible? How do you move in that direction? So there's a lot of research that actually changes the strike price, changes the uh, the volatility associated with underlying investments. And that is an uh, avenue to me of future research that is going to be very important. And thinking about, um, uh, thinking about uh, uh, idea of liquidity risks, things that uh, actually Daryl was talking about a moment ago, the demand and supply imbalances that occur and how that affects equilibrium prices is just important as well. So I think the 
efficient markets area and market prices, really option market prices are insurance prices. And uh, the interesting thing is that one of the beauties of the technology that was developed and subsequent work that's followed, uh, which is very profound and important for our field and our science, is that, uh, that as risk increases, the price of options increase. It tells us what risk is. The price of insurance increases. We know risk is increasing, and that is very important. So, and we can think about thinking about efficiency in markets. It's very hard, as Fama said, to figure out what is the stock market efficient. Why? Because basically we have cash flows, we have financing policies differ, we have discount rates we have to estimate, and all and the cross-sectional dynamics are all very important. Well, basically with the option market, it's if it's easy to test efficiency, though a lot of people argue that the stock market is efficient and the option market is inefficient, which is always a surprise to me that people say no, the option market is not efficient and that, but Basically, even if you go back to uh, Fisher Black and my uh, testing of the option uh, option pricing and the over counter market versus the model in 1972, before anyone knew about the model, we just used the model to test the efficiency of observed uh, over the counter option prices that we got, and basically we found that the market was pretty efficient at that time and that it was very hard to make money when you included the transaction cost of dealing in that market. And, uh, and basically it was, uh, to me, a, a great test. And also others have followed on of saying very much so that the option market is very hard to beat. It's very efficient. And so, and that means that the prices we see are very valuable and they give us a lot of value about changing risks. And so I think that uh, in the corporate decisions, we've seen obviously that options have been extended dramatically. Uh, Bob Merton's work, other people's work that have followed on from that to really talk about the idea that risky debt and thinking about risky debt really subsumes uh, the safe debt in, in the marketplace. So, you know, I think options and time are also very important because we have uh, the uh, time and the shapes of distributions are not constant. Options, every period are important. And if we go from being average returns uh, to looking at compound returns, then we know that risk dominates really in the short run. Every period matters in the short run if you're thinking about investment. And basically, if risk dominates uh, in the short run, and that uh, average returns or compound returns take a longer time to unfold. And uh, then basically uh, we are really thinking about time and how risk and the shapes of distribution should affect or could affect our investment decisions, as opposed to assuming that we're continually drawing from the same urn and that we can make decisions just based on historical data, as opposed to bringing in and what the markets are telling us as well. And F here is that constraints really have a large effect on decision-making. A lot of people are, and are short a put option and at what price and why. So as shocks or tails occur, uh, that basically then people realize or investors realize they cannot hold their positions and therefore have to reduce risks and and generate this generates or could generate tails and we could have a liquidity crisis evolve as everyone who's short a put and earning the premium then realizes that they didn't plan for the obverse or the fact that they would have to uh, their put would be exercised against them so we have individuals have tremendous amounts of debt they have debt to them, uh, to their future consumption, their family, legacy, healthcare, et cetera. And pension funds uh, have commitments uh, for private equity and other invest and other activities and, and endowments and retirees as well. And so the interesting thing is when you have constraints that you have to reduce risk, then it has to be the case that we have people coming in 
and uh, to actually intermediate. So I think that the idea that we have uh, a huge role for options and theory and applications in both time and the dimensions of time and risk changing over time and the fact that that's very important to a lot of our science going forward and also the effects of constraints. The idea that individuals do have constraints and many people are short a put option and basically what do they do when they have to where the put is exercised against them, what does that do to the markets and how it affects decision-making ex ante and ex post as a result of the shocks that do occur. So I think the time series is important and we spent a lot of time in time series. We had a lot of data on time series. We've had a lot of historical data. We've had a lot of work on factors. We've had a lot of work on the dimensions of looking at uh, return and return generations and what, how far we can get from the idea of assuming uh, we're drawing from the same urn. But we also have to realize the cross-section is rich in information and there are many cross-sectional signals. And so to improve compound returns, we must focus on risk and changes in risk. So we know mathematically a compound return is equal to expected return minus a half the variance plus a third the skew, okay? And so, We've always known that risk is a drag on returns. A compound return is less than the expected return or average return because of the convexity. Or is, And people in the bond markets know convexity and have used it a tremendous amount. And so if asset risk and correlations are changing dramatically over time, we cannot assume uh, that uh, risk is constant. And the math tells us that skew or upside risk is important as tails are everything, okay? And a third, we have to try to think about reducing excess volatility. So if we think that we're drawing from the same urn and we have volatility in our investment, then basically we're also thinking about uh, that if we have excess volatility, what I mean by that, if we have a target risk and we allow our risk to fluctuate around the target risk, that's also reducing our compound return. And so we know that skew, if we look at the data, I've done this and making skew estimates from the option markets and upside versus downside. And uh, basically you can find that that's uncorrelated with the estimates of volatility from the option markets that, um, and there's no reason why skew should be, uh, uh, cor uh, should be correlated with volatility. And uh, just the same way as we have uh, interest rate curves and uh, the like, the curve and the slope are not related to each other uh, in any particular way. So risk is both upside and downside risk. And risk is not only thinking about downside, we spent a lot of time thinking about risk and risk management as downside risk, but really risk is also missing out on the upside. So, and that's very important. And so I think passive portfolios need to be replaced by risk managed passive portfolios. The indices themselves are passive. So when someone is buying a passive portfolio, it's not risk managed. If I buy an S&P 500 portfolio, yes, it's passive in the sense I'm not acting. But if you want to risk management to increase your compound return, and there's information available in the option market as to future volatility, and there's information available in the option market as to upside and downside risk or skewness in the market, then obviously you can increase your compound return by managing your volatility, reducing your excess volatility, because if volatility is a drag, excess volatility is a drag. If skewness to the negative side reduces your compound return, that must mean that skewness to the positive side increases your positive return. And so I think the interesting thing is in finance that we've done is we've looked at variance or volatility as a, as a reduced form measure of risk. But really we know drawdown is a measure of risk 
in the sense, and skewness is a measure of risk in terms of positive skewness to the upside improves your compound return. And we want to manage risk not only to the downside, but think about enhancing it to the upside. So uh, volatility doesn't distinguish between good and bad risk. In fact, Markowitz, even in his book in 59, said that he, he didn't have estimates of downside risk. And so we have to think about the power of the option markets, which gives us estimates of good and bad risk. So volatility doesn't tell us anything. It just says up and down assumes distributions are symmetric. And that's not true if you actually look at what the option market is telling us. And the market in options does allow us to price upside and downside risk. If we look at how the market does in terms of efficiency, I ran some tests recently. I'm working on sort of paper on this and, and giving some of these results. But if you use the S&P 500 and use 60-day realized volatility uh, versus the forward predictions from the option market and historical data, it, you see that basically the intercept is close to zero, okay, in terms of the forecast, and the implied volatility completely dominates any historical volatility, even in using the uh, market estimates. And basically, a lot of, even with you get an implied volatility, when you're using the index, because the correlations are changing, it's hard to estimate correlations. It's easier to estimate volatilities, as we know. And that's another thing that's kind of fascinating. If it's easier to estimate volatilities, and it's hard to estimate correlations and means, okay, basically, uh, why not use the information it's easier to estimate as opposed to to looking at long time series and data, try to estimate what risk premiums are in the market, which are very hard to estimate versus using option data. And Poon and et cetera, and, um, and Granger uh, really looked in a summary paper in 2003 and really, they said that option information was the only thing that was important in surveying 63 papers and that using historical uh, data, whether it's GARCH, eGARCH, or anything else, was not as important. And so you see that basically, so that coefficient, the intercept is uh, zero, the coefficient sort of is not one. But if you, what we I did is expand these things to look at results from the cross section regression each month using uh, future 30 day realized volatility using current actual forecast of implied volatility on individual securities. So here we had the top 1000 stocks by market cap since uh, with liquid option markets, okay, from actually 2000 in January to September, 2021. And if you use a 30 day volatility, Basically, the implied volatility has a, con a slope of 0.94. So you don't have the correlation problem because these are individual security using sort of a Fomic Macbeth rolling uh, regression analysis versus only the past realized volatility as a 0.56 predictor, and both together around 92. And the constant, again, is insignificant. But the interesting thing is when you, that, that was an amazing result because it, it's essentially virtually unbiased. The slope is near one, and probably insignificantly different from one. And basically, uh, the, it completely subsumes any past data if one's forecasting the 30-day ahead volatility. And if you use the 60-day volatility, to uh, that basically using the 60-day volatility to forecast 60 days ahead and using the 30-day volatility as well, that basically the 60-day volatility completely dominates. Uh, so the term structure is good as well. So it's estimating a 30-day volatility forward go, using historical data, of uh, using the implied 30-day uh, by, uh, by the individual stocks versus uh, the 60-day, using the 60-day implied volatility, the, the term structure as well. Uh, seems to be uh, also consistent with the data. So these these were always just another amazing results to show you, yes, that the, the volatilities are changing because historical volatility is not sufficient as a statistic. Using implied volatility tends to dominate, uh, which to me uh, seems to be 
uh, very important. And so if you look at um, this, so if you look at making money, okay, since we only have one run of time, that basically we can forecast the future to make money and try to get risk premiums or, or, or alphas or whatever you want to talk about or factors and how these should be done. And, and you know, in efficient markets, very hard to know yet why those uh, are important we, and the like. But I think the second way to make money is really think about the constraints of others and how to mitigate these constraints, you know, why do liquidity premiums exist? Why are they high? When is liquidity risk changing and how to think about uh, supplying liquidity risk? And those are why constraints tend to exist. And then basically trying to think about making the investment ride boring, you know, trying to reduce the volatility drag. So having uh, beta risk management, either to enhance compound returns or to think about thinking about how to reduce excess volatility. So risk management really is insurance, which is reserves, a cushion, and diversification, and it's insurance. But risk management is all of those things, and they're dynamics in those things. It's not just insurance, diversification, and uh, not just reserves and insurance and risk and diversification. I mean, I one of my first, first wife, we used to have uh, pillows on our, on our couch, you know, so we had a cushion, you know, and a reserve, you know, and, and, but I could never sit on the couch. So I never knew why I had the cushions on the couch or why I had the reserve. And, you know, that to me is something we have to think about. If you look at, I ran some tests back at we, uh, from, uh, here from, um, uh, uh 1997, uh, when data were available on the S&P 500 on options, put options, and on uh, put options to April 2020, which I, at time I had a run. And we always have heard that, you know, the 60-40 was a wonderful strategy, which is used by investors. And if you think about it, it really is a risk management strategy, because what I did was we bought put options that the maximum one-year drawdown is around 30% for a 60-40 strategy when the market drops about 50%. And the S and P drops about fifty percent. When you buy put spreads, then it turns out it's about this uh, at a thirty percent drawdown, which is the exact approximate drawdown because rolling these uh, puts forward in time. Then and the return was about seven percent, with a maximum drawdown of around thirty percent. And so basically, that a put protection strategy of a full equity strategy is approximately the same as a 60-40 strategy. So 60-40 strategy is an insurance strategy. And interestingly enough, if you put if the expected risk premium on the equity markets around 5% and 40% is in US equity bonds, then basically you have a premium, a loss of around 2%, a cost of around 2% to actually uh, buy the uh, put protection. And I was very surprised when you had this huge bull bond market from the 80s on into the 90s and 2000s, and you had a so-called so negative correlation between equities and bonds at the time that what we had is this results were so strong as this in terms of protection. So if you look at protection, basically um, the price of buying a one month put is uh, for a, a, sorry, a one-year put for a maximum 12-year drawdown and rolling it forward is about 2% a year, which is costly if you think of that. But a 60-40 strategy is an insurance strategy. So the interesting thing, if you're buying a 60-40 strategy, the most important question is what are you going to do once you get the drawdown or once you got the protection? Is it always holding 60-40? That's just an insurance strategy. So the main question I have, if you have insurance, and you buy insurance, you don't do anything with it. What value is the insurance? Why just hold the 60-40 strategy uh, if you're an investment person? And so we have to think about uh, that. And if you have a 20% drawdown, maximum drawdown, it costs about to roll puts and the like, it costs around 4.4%. And with a 30, 35% when it's around the 2%. So it's interesting, uh, these are pro like a 5% drawdown is approximately an investment grade portfolio and, and the like, or uh, you know, somewhere between an investment grade and a higher yield portfolio. And uh, you know, it, it gets this 
return loss versus what you have for the S&P 500 is approximately of that value. And then the same thing if you have a, a, a more balanced portfolio, the 20% drawdown. So the, these are just important statistics to ask the question about everything that we talk about in insurance is really could be subsumed within understanding what's going on in the option markets. So if we think about providers of insurance to earn liquidity premiums or demanders of insurance, so who should be selling insurance in the market? This is an open question that I have. It's something that I, I think we haven't don't have an exact answer to. Maybe I'm missing the research in the literature, but the idea that sellers of insurance should be long horizon investors and those who have sufficient liquidity to meet contingencies or low leverage investors or those who have protected their downside and saved the bacon, their bacon, and they can add to inventory at times and imbalance, imbalances. So the main question with liquidity, and this is the key thing we don't understand, if the price of liquidity is changing and risks are changing and correlations are changing, how do we think about when we use the cushion, when we get back into the market, when we add risk, how to do this dynamically? And this is, uh, and what signals we have that make us more to want to re-risk or to reduce risk as we have information from the option markets and the like. So at times of shock, liquidity providers step in to earn premiums when supply demand imbalances are, are large, but when do they step in? How do they step in? At what dimension? How do you scale in to add liquidity to the markets? Dara was bringing this up in his talk. And these are research that we really have to think about to augment. And how can we use information from the option markets to test our theories and when uh, liquidity and how liquidity changes over time and how we can use the option market to adjust or figure out when liquidity prices are changing, such as correlations changing or skewness is changing in the market. It's interesting. If you look at liquidity provisors, people say that private equity provides liquidity to the market. If you buy private equity, you're getting a private asset, so you get liquidity. You're providing liquidity, you get a premium for that. But I got data from Cambridge Associates, which really show uh, from that over this period of time, uh, that if you look at the um, the uh, uh, private equity uh, versus uh, excluding for uh, venture capital versus the thirty percent of the smallest U.S. equity capital stocks levered, okay, then you end up greater than five hundred million. You end up with a correlation of about seventy five percent, point seven five, with similar returns. And so the lower volatility periods you get in 2000 and the lower volatility period you get in 2008 is just because of marks. But if you use the compound return, they see that the private equity index does about the same as investing in uh, underlying uh, levered equity. So if you're, it, it seems to me that it can't be just providing a liquidity premium. There has to be other things that one has to be able to make returns in investing in private assets. And um, this does not include, obviously, the cost of employing cash efficiently or, or, or researching opportunities. So it may be overstated. And so I think that the innovation prescription we have in finance in the, is basically that we want to provide functions of finance uh, faster, and we want to do it uh, more individualized, and we want to do it more flexibly and to reduce our option costs. So if we look at all the functions of finance, it all has moved in this direction over time to move to things faster, more uh, individualized, and more flexible. We think about all the innovations that have occurred have either been based in the idea of, of transacting. Uh, the idea of investing uh, in projects, uh, in in uh, saving for the future, in risk management, in, in the idea of these functions, it's all been based on trying to re uh, reduce the cost of options, to increase flexibility. So the function of finance has really evolved to support this. And many constraints uh, are, are not to do this. And so the interesting thing is these constraints what do the constraints do and how does that affect 
uh, decision making and pricing? And what is the opportunity cost associated in, in not handling uh, and not trying to reduce the volatility drag, not trying to use the optionality that you have to really improve your compound return. And so I think this is really important. So I think that um, a lot of it is trying to re reduce the cost of constraints and think about how to enhance efficiency by building trust. And a lot of what we have in, in finance and economics is really thinking about a hardware to software to uh, thinking about how we do just thinking in the like and how basically each of these really increases flexibility. When you know something for certain, you build it in hardware. If you know what you want to do or how you want to work, you build it in hardware. The more you have uh, uncertainty, the more flexibility you need, the more software at a cost, you need more flexibility. And the most flexibility you need at all at times of shock because you don't know anything, time compresses, time compresses, and therefore the most flexibility is really how we think about things. And everything in our science is moving over time to building technologies and building evolution of things to increase flexibility, decrease optionality and lower costs uh, providing this flexibility, this optionality, and uh, it's done through software. So the key is more data to reduce the cost of the option, more data to increase flexibility. And so you get things like robotics or AI, and obviously all of that is trying to reduce uncertainty and enable us to make decisions without and reducing the cost of optionality by giving us the flexibility. And so we get that in terms of precision farming or medicine, et cetera. And if you look at innovation has to lead the infrastructure. One of the things we know is that you end up, it, it, if you think about it, the investment banks took years to move from an agency to principal model. And, and that moving the banks after even Black Scholes and Merton and other came on after that, the investment banks didn't go from an agency model to a principal model for 10, 15 years before they realized that being a principal was much more efficient and more flexible than just the agency model. Uh, you have decarbonization, AI, cybersecurity, blockchain, robotics, 3D printing. All of these have innovation leading infrastructure. If innovation leads infrastructure by economics would suggest that necessarily to be true because you can't innovate and know for success whether the innovation is going to be successful. You have to build in optionality. Infrastructure must follow innovation. And only successful innovations or uncertainties being reduced, then you know there's going to be growth or convexity. And as innovation creates growth and convexity, infrastructure follows. And But as you get more uncertainty than we know in finance, the more uncertainty you have, the more it is that cheaters can come into the market and then hide under the volatility and provide solutions that are actually create uh, risks and create risks to society and create risks to our inventions and our innovations. And so we have to trade off how fast innovation leads infrastructure and what infrastructure can do to actually think about at lower costs, reducing the cheaters, reducing the uncertainty that's generated by cheaters and the volatility that they come in. So there's a lot of research ahead. It's gonna have to be how innovation leads infrastructure and we also have research, development, and testing. Basically, research is testing. Development is testing. We can't have research without testing. And the greater the uncertainty of development, the greater the volatility, the more testing reduces the uncertainty, reduces the optionality, and reduces the value, reduces the tails. Right now, for example, we have in research and development, in development and manufacturing, we've seen the development of a digital twin. Instead of having to build a factory and put the factory in place and then get into the deciding whether or not this factory needs to be rejiggered at huge cost, what we've done is we had now the digital twin, which is a, a logical factory, and trying to think about all the simulations we can do to reduce and understanding it through dynamics, to reduce the volatility, to reduce the uh, cost of the optionality of being fixed options. And this is uh, a really important part of th thinking about the growth of options going forward. So reducing the volatility of options reduces the cost of irreversibility and basically helps us in thinking about 
how we can think about the technologies developing over time to make things faster, more individualized, and more flexibly in our development. So that this is what innovation is going to. So that innovation prescription is really faster, individualized, and flexible. In our finance, all our finance functions, the same thing. In all innovations and investment, the same thing. In all structures, we're doing the same thing. It's flexibility is to really increase the value of optionality because volatility is not constant. Vol and there's and basically uh, there's too much, could be too much volatility in the market. And uh, you can have really a necessity to understand the importance of tails. And uh, for we only have one run of time. And basically with one run of time, we have to think about what that means. We don't have the law of large numbers just doesn't apply in many of the things we do in finance. The law of large numbers with one run of time is is very important. So climate scientists talk about 2030 to 2050 and the average temperature increases. But we need we need to worry about the tails. We need to worry about what would happen if a tail event occurred, an extreme cost occurred to actually think about how to restructure and what would happen at that time. So basically it's the tails of the distribution have a great effect and as energy is going to be manufactured and not mined in the future, there's tremendous uncertainty about the feedstock we're gonna have for the new energy. And with one run of time, every period matters. And so over smaller periods, since every period matters, that risk dominates and risk dominates over every period expectations are dominated by risk. And this is especially so when risks are changing and distribution shapes are changing all the time. And, and we need to think about reducing the tail risks to increase convexity. And we also need to think about increasing participation when the risk of the upside is greatest. And so the idea is I think the debate is really uh, misdirected. The static strategies are misdirected. And why are static, static strategies so prevalent? It's because of trust. It's because of constraints. Why do people stay close to benchmarks? Why do you do relative performance, not absolute performance? Why? And how are we going to create ways in which we can measure absolute performance and the sanctity of absolute performance in this, and be able to figure out whether there is performance enhancements or that cheaters are not coming into the market given the uncertainty of measurement. And the option market gives us a chance to move in that direction and will continue to do so from where we are now and into the future. So I think that there's tremendous amounts of research ahead in options and the like, whether corporate finance you know, is flexibility and, and what does flexibility mean? What is in a, what is the idea of creating more flexibility? How do you create more flexibility? What's the dynamics of innovation to create this flexibility? And what are the investments? How do liquidity occur? Liquidity constraints and in the private world, what are liquidity constraints in our investment world as individuals and saving for retirement? Right now, all the saving model for retirement are linear. They talk about saving a certain fraction uh, pay, spending a certain fraction of your retirement dollars over time. There's no uncertainty in that. There's no change in your risk preferences. You know, my kids now say, dad, invest in risky assets. You're saving for me. You're not for your own self anymore. So uh, it changes over time. It's, it's really alpha and beta. We're only measuring alpha and assuming beta or, or market risk or no one in con we have to think about how beta risk change how risk are changing what are the dynamics on how they're changing and this is leads to great research and opportunities going forward monetary policy the same way you know should if we always want to dampen volatility, is it artificial? Do we create a damp volatility where everything is calm, 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 and then it explodes and creates liquidity risk and risk? So what is the level of volatility that we need? What's the level of volatility that we need in an economy so that it creates enough, enough uh, uh, ability that we realize that trying to damp volatility is very expensive and could create wrong decision-making of individuals. So I think that basically even the behavioral finance area is, uh, is itself 
a lot of it is based on a lot of it is based on options you know the regret option you can you know there's models you can buy at the high you can sell at the max or buy at the min and you can price those one thing to talk about behavioral finance but it's also to price what this cost of this behavior is and does it make sense and how you can mitigate some of those costs going forward so thank you today for listening to me and uh, I think it's an exciting area and I think we're going to have great opportunities uh, going forward. So thank you, Sanjay, for uh, the conference and the like. And I'm sure that many of the talks that we've had today are illuminating and very good. I'm sorry I didn't come in earlier. Thank you, Myron. And uh, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Scholz. Says, actually, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is a very general one. You kind of uh, discussed it, addressed some of it, but since the publication of the journal, what has surprised you on the upside and what has kind of disappointed you in terms of developments in the option or applications of it? You know, we've heard the Warren Buffett say about being the weapons of mass destruction. So what, what are your takes? And what are your surprises uh, in the developments of the markets over the last 50 years? I, I don't know what uh, Warren Brothers said that misused options are weapons. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't absolute in that statement. Sure. Like, <laughs> like, always we paraphrase people's statements, you know. Like, is uh, but I understand what you're saying. Actually, what so okay, what back is that? What uh, surprised me actually when uh, Fisher and I developed the option pricing model and then uh, followed on Bob Merton's work as well, which is so wonderful and important that basically. We, not, we thought we were just explaining existing contracts. We talked a lot about the, uh, the uh, options that are embedded in a lot of decision making we do and a lot of assets we have. So, you know, the pricing of, uh, of uh, options and corporate liabilities was the title of our paper. But what surprised me the most was basically how it changed the whole nature of investments going forward in the sense that what it did was create a movement, as I said, from the agency model, you know, where you had people buying and sell bonds in, in uh, corporations to uh, in investment banks to actually acting as a principal, using technology, using mathematics, using modeling, using thinking, using option technology, actually to price the securities and then to give those securities to clients clients and let them secure the clients decide uh, and, and then what the clients wanted and at the same time then to offset the risk in the market. So that was uh, an, a surprising evolution to me. What has bothered me the most is why we're so stuck in this performance relative to a benchmark. We're so stuck on alphas and we're not thinking about dynamic risk management enough. Why is it the case? that there's so little work done and, and trillions of dollars of assets that are in static investment policies and not in dynamic investment policies. Why are we not thinking about, even though business is doing it, is creating more flexibility in all their activities, which is really a surprise to me as well. So I think that is important. And uh, you know why it's the case that monetary policy or monetary theorists haven't taken uncertainty is the primary start and develop monetary theory from that as opposed to taking it the other way around, thinking about static theory and then putting an error on the model and integrating the error out and going back to using just historical models and data without thinking about how uncertainty impacts policy uh, very uh, importantly. So I think those are important considerations. Uh, one more question then I'll ask the audience. I liked your uh, chart uh, about uh, comparing 60-40 to the put protected uh, portfolio. So I was thinking that that was during the period of the bond boom market, as you mentioned. So maybe going forward, actually, the better 60-40 would be to use the put protected rather than, again, continue investing 60-40 to bonds. What, what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it could be. I mean, basically, if we thought that the correlation structure, you know, the prices are what they are. It's an efficient market. I was surprised how efficient the put market was. And okay. I'm trying to use that as an efficiency thing. But that one of the problems we have when you assume a normal distribution or a log normal distribution, that basically what you're assuming is that when you have 
uh, a two standard deviation move, a 60-40 says, oh, if your volatility of equities is 15% and you have a 60% in bonds, you have a 10% volatility. And people say, oh, that means you have a 10, 20% drawdown. But a 20% drawdown, we didn't have that in 07, 08. We had a 20, we had a, a 30% drawdown and the whole market went down 50%. And the same thing in 2001, 2002, we had great shocks in 2010 and 2012 and 2020, okay? And so you had great drawdowns that occur in the marketplace and conversely draw ups. But basically what I'm what what is interesting is that if the correlation structure Chain is not always negatively correlated uh, going forward, it more predominantly negatively correlated, or not the tailwind, then basically, uh, you know, maybe a strategy which has more equity and then more protection of the tails would provide a better results because you can be dynamic in how you adjust your risk and how much protection you buy. It is no, it is no necessity to buy the same level of protection. That's what Skewness is telling you. Skewness is telling you if you can measure Skewness, know when that basically as Skewness uh, increases, you want to increase your risk. You don't want to hold it the same. You want to increase your risk. So we have to think about ma risk ma portfolio management is taking into account not only the average, but then Skewness as well. Thank you. Anything from the audience? Bing? Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding to uh, correlation. You know, take hedge funds as one example. You know, they're getting uh, very crowded either because of competitiveness or because of market is more efficient. So what is your view about the future alpha in the hedge fund domain? Well, actually, you know, the idea for me, the important thing is liquidity and supply demand imbalances that are caused by constraints. And uh, liquidity is a supply demand imbalance. You have suppliers of liquidity and demanders of liquidity. Why at times the demanders of liquidity tend to come into the markets and demand tremendous amounts of liquidity in the market. And uh, Daryl's talked about this prior to my talk and has done a lot of research on this, but you have a supply demand imbalance coupled with a normal process on top of that. So we have to understand what, how the supply demand imbalance affects things. And if you have in the market now, is it the case you have hedge funds that are presumably buying expertise and being willing with their capital to supply liquidity, and I don't. And having a model to supply liquidity is important. And when to supply, how much to supply, when to scale in, et cetera, and how to garner information. So basically, what is the return? Is it quiet for a while? You make very little, and then at times it's very large because the demanders of liquidity are willing to pay you a price for liquidity because they sold an option and now have to buy it back. Okay, they were making the pre a little premium a lot of the time and occasionally take a big loss. And so that's a dynamic system with those who are demanding liquidity. Why do they demand liquidity and why the supply demand imbalance occurs? How does the supply demand imbalance mitigate it over time through intermediation process, whether it's through the banks, whether it's through the um, hedge funds, et cetera. And sometimes you can have too many suppliers and too little demanders. And conversely, sometimes too many demanders and not enough suppliers. Who supplies? When do they come in? How do they know when to supply? What the uncertainty does? is a very important problem. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Scholz. Uh, this was a, a great occasion, a great honor for us uh, to celebrate uh, the 50th anniversary of the, of the model. And uh, uh, thank you for taking time to speaking to our uh, faculty, students, and supporters. And you have a wonderful welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on. Uh, so I'm going to introduce